it's not that you necessarily are going to know every single thing, whatever, um, but just working with the program over and over and over and over again, this will start to become secondhand to you. Um, however, what I'd like to get through today, and depending on at least to get through the camera tab today, and then possibly the exposure tab, because what I'm trying to do is get you up to the point right before we start to do processing, color correction, that kind of stuff. We will pick up processing and color correction sort of towards the end of the semester. But I'm trying to do this sort of kind of makes sense so that going back into the shooting assignments, this is the process that you're working with. Again, we're not going to be processing stuff out because all I'm looking to get from you guys is raw files. So with that all being said, um, I want to build a session from scratch with you guys, and then we'll see what happens with the camera. So to do that, again, in Capture uh, uh, 112, come over to the library tab, the one all the way to the left-hand side. <clears throat> and I don't see mine right now. Yeah, OK. Um, and then if we take a look, uh, again, if you want the same screen that I've got going right here, come up to the window menu down to Workspace and come down to Simplified Tethered Capture. That, then your screen will look exactly like my screen does for the most part. Um, click on the Library tab and then again in this sort of like drop down menu here, there's right next to it, there's a little plus. Click on that plus and we are going to build a new session, not a new catalog, but a new session. And we are going to call that new session 201910, and look at today's date, the 26, 26 underscore CCC underscore, uh, we got to call it something else other than C1 Pro Demo. What are we going to call it today? Uh, 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 camera tethering, so camera T, how's that sound? Okay. Um, in my case, I'm going to put mine on my shared user folder. Again, for those of you who have built a new Capture One user, you should have this shared folder. Has everybody who's built that extra one able to find it? Okay, because sometimes people don't realize that shared is actually a user, um, and that's where it always is. So if you don't know, if you can't find it, whatever, I'll show you where it ultimately ends up. You just go to your... Um, uh, your root folder, in my case, mine's called boot uh, uh, MPB13. Uh, most people leave theirs uh, labeled as Macintosh HD. There's a folder on that that has users, and inside this users, this is where your shared folder is. So anyway, that's where I'm going to put mine. The rest of you guys should put yours um, either if you're on the studio computers and whatever is safe camera storage is now, or um, put it on your uh, in your uh, pictures folder. Uh, why wouldn't you put it in your desktop? Is there a downside? What's the downside? Exactly. So at any rate, I'm going to say OK to this. It builds a brand new session for me. Uh, I'm going to take a look at this guy again right here to check to see exactly where that guy put. To and th little things like this actually make a lot of sense. To check to see where that is, I'm going to hover over the capture folder. Again, this is the alias to whatever we call capture folder. We can make any folder in this computer a capture folder. So this only points to that. This is not... It's going to go to the session capture folder right now only because by default that's what it gets set up as in the beginning, but it does not need to stay that way. So at any rate, uh, I'm going to go find this uh, folder in the finder. To do that, again, I'm just going to tell you guys that you need to do a right click. For me, a right click is holding down the control key and then clicking on my mouse and I get a drop down. For those of you who have a uh, right uh, a, a two button mouse, it's the right button. And then for those of you who know how to do right, I think right button is a two finger swipe down on a trackpad. At any rate, you need to get the drop down menu and you need to come down and say, show me this in the finder. So we're going to say, show it in the finder. It comes out here, it is actually is in the finder right here. And it's selected. I am now going to build three different uh, subfolders in here. So I am again, I'm clicked inside my capture folder. I'm going to hold down the shift key and the command key and hit N. It just builds a new blank folder. If you can't remember that, simply come up to the file menu and come down to new folder. Either way, it'll do the same thing. And we're going to call this 01 and then hit the return key and it'll do it. Now, if we do another new folder right now, because this folder is selected, it'll put the next new folder inside. It'll nest it inside 01. I don't want to do that. So I'm going to simply click in the space here 
right, I just clicked right below it. It goes ahead and selects capture, and I'm going to do the same thing again. Uh, Shift uh, Command N, and I'm going to call this O2. Hit the return key. Again, click in the space right below it. Shift Command N, O3. So this is going to be my three different shots in this. So with these three different shots, uh, or with this still visible, I'm going to collapse my other finder window. So what I want to do is I want to be able to see Capture One in the background. So I now have got, I'm still in the finder, I've got my three folders right here, and I'm going to target it for this session favorites right here. So I'm simply going to select these three. I just clicked and dragged across them. You could also click the top one, hold down the shift key and click the bottom one. You can also click on the top one, hold down the command key and click both of the others. And either way, you need all three of these selected and I'm going to then simply drag them on top of session favorites. And you'll see I've got a little plus three icon guy right there. And then all of a sudden under session favorites, I have three different, uh, um, uh, three different uh, uh, subfolders. Again, this is a very poorly named thing. These are not favorites in the conventional sense. These are subfolders and they sit inside of my capture folder. So now I am actually going to make 01 my true capture folder. Because again, the way this would be designed is if, if for me, the way I shoot, um, I do a different shot for every dress or for every different makeup look. It's a separate shot. So I would have, if I was gonna do 15 in a day, I would do 15 of these. If I was gonna do five in a day, I'd do five of these. But I'm gonna start shooting into my very first shot folder. So to designate it as such, again, hover over it, click on this, hover over it, hold down that you need a right, uh, a right mouse click uh, or a, yeah, a right mouse click. So I'm gonna hold down control key, click on the drop down menu and say set as capture folder. And it's gonna ask you if you wanna remember the previous one. The previous one is the parent folder of all of this. I don't wanna remember that one, so I'm gonna say no. You could always add it later as a session favorite by simply going out to the finder and dragging the capture folder onto here. It would do the same thing exactly like we did. You'll notice that there's a little icon around this bottom right now. It looks like a camera. That is telling me that this is the capture folder. So now when I come up, you can do it in either place, but I just wanna make sure you guys understand this capture folder up here is no longer pointing at the parent capture folder. It is pointing at this folder that is marked 01. To see that, right click on this guy, go to the drop down menu and come down to show and finder and you'll see it is selected 01. It did not select the parent folder capture folder right here. It's selected 01 because that's what we designated as the capture folder. If I come back over here and click on the 03 down here, Again, right click on the drop down menu and say, I want to set this as my capture folder. Now, when I go to capture folder, I, uh, I alias up at the top, command click and say, show me in the finder. It will go out and it will pick 03. So this reflects whatever I have designated as the capture folder. And it's this little thing right here. So I'm going to go back to 01. I'm going to, again, set 01 as my capture folder. You can also get to the finder from here if you hold down the, if you do a right mouse click, sorry. If you do a right mouse click on this and say, show me in the finder, either way, it'll get to the same place. It'll do the exact same thing. Uh, okay, are there questions about this? Are we good? Okay, so that gets us through this part actually pretty well. So I think everybody's feeling somewhat good about this. A couple of other sort of housekeeping things that you should know about. Um, this uh, whole set of tools that sit up here at the top is customizable. And I wanna show you guys sort of what that means. You can actually change this up here. If you hover over the very top part of this where along where these sort of tool sets are, if again, uh, right clicking uh, is pervasive in Capture One. If you hold down the control key and click on this, you can actually see that you can do an icon or text. Icon and text has been offered since Capture One 3, and it has never worked. So I'm gonna click on it and see if it works now. Oh my God, it does. This is the first time. It only took them 
What's 3 to 12? It only took them nine iterations of Capture One to actually get the text under there. This never existed before. So if you need a little help about what's going on, this would be a great thing to actually have on under there. However, if you hold down again, do your right click to come down and say Customize Toolbar. You can change things on this. At this stage of the game, you'll see up here, these are spacers. You can actually uh, click on these things and drag them out to get rid of them. You can move stuff around. So if you say, for instance, really want your focus mask to be over closer to here, you can actually drag it over there to move it. Um, so all of this stuff can sort of be, uh, things in here can be changed. Now, in my case, there's a number of things here that I don't really like. So I'm gonna get rid of, sorry. I'm going to get rid of these spacers. I'm going to grab my exposure warning and drag it further over here. What I don't have on here is a copy and paste, which is really weird. I don't know why it's not on there. This is, would be for adjustments. So I'm going to bring this up here to bring copy, paste, and adjustments up there. And then this copy and apply, I'm going to bring him up here as well. Just to show you guys that this stuff can actually be done. We're not going to get into copy and paste these guys today, but we will get into those later uh, on. Um, so you can customize this any way you want. If you do not, if you screw all of this up and you simply want to get back to the original, the default, simply come down here to the bottom and grab this entire set and drag it up again and let go. And this will take you back to the very beginning. But again, I'm gonna get rid of a couple of these because there are a couple of things that I do want to get to to talk to about today. So I am gonna drag focus mask over. I'm gonna see what else is over here on the side by simply clicking on this and it's not gonna let me get over there. Let's see what happens if I drag this guy over. Now, there's nothing over there, so I don't need to worry about that. But I do need to worry about my exposure warning. This guy right here, the thing that looks like a triangle with an uh, uh, um, uh, exclamation point in the middle, I do want to bring that up. So I like to have both of my warnings right here. Uh, so then I'm simply going to hit Done. And then I'm going to go to, again, with my capture, uh, my 01 is my capture folder. I am going to go to my camera right now. And you guys need to go to your camera as well. And you need to go ahead and tether your camera up and turn it on. I'm also going to pass around a hunk of tape and I want everybody to tear off a six inch piece of that tape and then tear that in half. And then I want you to fold so you've got a little handle on both of them. So take a look at what I've got right here. I'm just folding over a little bit of this so I've sort of got a handle. Do that for both of your pieces of tape. So then when you connect your tether cable to your computer, one of these pieces of tape goes around the connection and make sure you don't tape over your little handle so that you can actually undo this. So again, I'm simply taping around that connection and rolling this around to the point that my handle does that my handle stays free so that I can take this thing off really easily. And then the other piece of tape, you need to use that as a safety for your cord. So I am going to put a little bit of slack into my computer, into this cord. I'm going to bring it behind my computer. Just a little bit of slack, and then you need to tape this to the cart. What we're looking for here is, again, we're trying to do two things. We're trying to keep it so that when somebody trips on this cord, 
and yanks it out of anything. If they yank it out of a computer, it won't fuck up the computer. If they yank it out of the camera, it won't fuck up the camera. All right, is everybody good with this part? And we might as well go through the whole camera part really fast. So do me a favor, take a look at your camera. Go ahead and turn it on. Um, click on the menu button on the top left-hand side. And don't worry about whatever is set up in this. We are going to return this guy to its defaults. We good? Okay, hang on. Ellie's not good. I'm guessing bad battery. No, it's okay. What's wrong? Oh, push the little uh, button in the middle. Oh, that's a lock? Yeah. That is so weird. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Good? Yes. Um, yeah, you can say no. You get the warning saying if you want to register, you can say no to that. Or do, remind me later, whatever. It, there's no advantage to it at all. Okay, so to reset this camera to its default, Turn the camera on, select the menu button on the top left hand side of it. Uh, with the menu up, uh, use the scroll wheel that's just, uh, that's right next to the shutter release. And you wanna scroll your, the drop down menus till you get over to the one that looks like a little wrench. And you'll notice that there are three little, uh, four little buttons that, so there's four screens of the wrench. That's, I guess, all I'm trying to say. And it's the, you'll see it's the four little dots on the left-hand side tell you which one you're in. The one that you need to be in is the wrench, which is the yellow color. Um, and it's the screen that's all the way to the right. It would be the last of the screens. And at the top of your uh, of that menu, it should have custom shooting modes, clear all camera settings, copyright information, and firmware. Is everybody there? All right, use the wheel that is right next to the LCD to scroll down, up or down, either one, to select that clear all camera settings, and then hit the set button. When you hit the set button, you'll see you get a screen that says either cancel or okay. Cancel is outlined. You need to use that same scroll wheel right next to the LCD to come over to okay, and then hit the set button again. This will actually return your camera to its defaults with one exception. And that exception is we need to continue using the scroll wheel by the shutter release to go to the right um, over to the one that looks like a camera now. And this has also got an orange um, uh, color coding for the icons. So it's not in the first of those screens. It's not in the, uh, it is in the second screen. So it's the second screen over. So again, I am uh, the second screen from the left of the orange one, the little camera, and use the scroll wheel that's right by your LCD to go all the way down to the bottom where it says custom controls and then click the set button. This is where you can change the uh, behavior of different buttons on your camera. So by default, the first one that you'll see outlined is the shutter release button. And <clears throat> I have no idea what your all says after that, but you can change those. If you click on the set button, it'll take you in, and this is how you can control whether you want what you want the shutter release button to do. Now the shutter release button is always gonna release the shutter, however, if you look at the three possible icons that are in here, though mine, the one of mine selected is the one that's all the way on the left hand side. And what it is, is it's a, it looks like a metering pattern plus the initials A and F. That's what's selected on mine. And what that means, you'll see, that tells you right above it, it says that it's going to start metering and it's also going to start autofocus. 
If I don't want that behavior, simply use the scroll wheel that's right by the LCD to uh, click over to the one that's in the very middle, the one that says metering start. Because the, to be the truth of, of the matter is I don't really care about metering in my camera. I'm always shooting on manual anyway. So basically what I've done is now if I accept this settings the way they are right now, I'm telling the camera that I do not want the shutter release to actually engage autofocus. So I'm going to hit the set button to do that. So that's how the first one is. Now the next button, down, so now I'm going to use my scroll wheel again to drop down one menu in my custom controls. And this is the AF dash on button. And in again, if you click on the set button now, it'll go in and these are your options. So in this case, and this is where I do want, I do want that AF button to actually be set up to do my autofocus. So I put it on the icon that's all the way to the left, which is again, the one that says metering with the initials AF in it, and then hit set again. So now the camera is, we're, we're getting close. So this part has now been set up. So by the way, when you reset your camera to its defaults, it does not change this one single menu. This menu stays sticky. So if you're expecting to get the buttons to return the way they are supposed to, that does not happen. I personally think that that's a mistake, but I don't, they don't pay me to do that. So at any rate, um, back up to the camera on the camera back and click menu again. So again, the very top left hand side. Menu again, we need to fix a couple of things that have now been changed. So again, using the scroll wheel that's right by your uh, uh, shutter release, go all the way to the camera that's on the left hand side and to the first of its screens. And you will see, so I'm all the way, so the camera that's all the way to the left, you get a red icon that's, or a red menu system that's around it. Again, I'm going to the far left of the screen. So of those four screens, I'm on the very first five screen, four screens, I'm on the very first one. And again, use your scroll wheel that's right next to the uh, LCD to actually co either go up or go down to get to image quality and click on the set button again. That'll bring open a menu that'll allow you to say how, what format you want to shoot this camera in. The scroll wheel that's right by your shutter release controls the raw uh, version. So if you use it to go from right now, by default, it's, sit on, it's set on a dash, which is telling you that this camera is not set up to shoot raw at all. You want it to shoot raw, so use the scroll wheel by the shutter release button to click over one to where it does select raw. You, if there, there are reasons where you would want to do an MRAW and an SRAW. What those are is they are resampled, but they're still raw files, but they're resampled. They're smaller. So what they do with medium RAW is they take a four square of pixels and they average it into one. What they do for uh, small RAW is they take a 16 square of pixels and average it into one. They still have the raw information. They're not, they don't have as high a resolution and they're not as detailed. But most importantly is that there are very few programs that can read these specialized versions of raw. So I don't really know anyone who uses them. Um, there may be some reason out there, but anyway, I'm not one of them. You can also shoot a JPEG at the same time that you shoot raw. Again, there are reasons that some people would have possibly for doing that, but we're not one of them right now. So with that being said, um, use the scroll wheel that's by the LCD to click the, and that's what controls the JPEG setting, and click it to go uh, all the way to the left on the dash, and then hit set. This camera is now set up to shoot raw. However, if you look on the top of the camera, you will also see that your ISO is going to be something really high and be changing uh, all around. That's because it is set to automatic. That's not what we want. So if you look on the top of your camera, right next to the scroll wheel by the shutter button, there is a button that just has ISO with a dash and then a little lightning bolt with a plus and minus. Click on that button once, that'll take you into your ISO control, and then use the scroll wheel right by the shutter release button. Usually I click it in one way and nothing changes. I scroll the scroll wheel uh, to the left, it doesn't change anything, and I scroll it to the right and it does. Uh, you need to change that so you get an ISO of 100. Um, and then finally, the last thing we need to do is the metering pattern. So if you look at the back of your camera, 
Um, on the right hand side, there's a series of three buttons. There is an AF dash on button. There's a little star asterisk like sort of button. And then there's another button that's got, it's a square that's got a little, it's supposed to look like a pattern in there. If you actually look inside of your camera and press that button, you will see the metering, uh, the autofocus pattern that comes up. And in my case, it brings up all 60 some odd points and there's a series of things that are blinking in here. That is not the metering pattern that I like to use. So if you also look at your shutter release between the wheel and the front and the shutter release, there is another button that has M-FN. If you get that metering pattern to show by pressing that back button and then hit that MFN button, it will scroll you through all the possible metering patterns. So I do one click that gives me a five square. I do a second click that gets me a nine square. And then I do a third click, which adds the metering point in the middle. So I've got a nine square. This is using the best autofocus points that this camera actually has. Um, and then you can just let that part disappear here and the metering has now been set and then the final thing that I like to do is remove the uh, eye cover the piece for the eye cover right here you can actually get to you don't have to do it if you've got little fingers you can really get in I'm trying to get to the uh, diopter control which is a, a scroll wheel that's on the very top right hand side of your eyepiece viewfinder you'll see that there's a little plus and a minus but it's really hard to get to if you pinch the viewfinder in and lift Lift up, you can remove it, and that way it'll let you get to that scroll wheel much easier. And then again, simply tap your camera to get the LED readout inside your camera so that you're looking at shutter speeds and apertures, you get your meter readout, and use that little scroll wheel to um, get your LCD, that LED readout in there as sharp as you can possibly get it. And when it is sharp and in focus, then your eye will be focused on the ground glass and this camera is ready to go. Are there any questions about any of that? Are we all good? Okay. So then back to uh, Capture One in Capture One really quickly. Um, uh, I am going to customize the menu that I've actually got here. There's a couple things that I want to change here. Um, this is personal. You guys can have your own system as well. So, um, but I'm just going to show you the one that I use. So for me, exposure evaluation, again, I use a color card to do all of my exposure evaluation. This is just wasted real estate for me. So I do not use this. To get rid of it, you click on the little three dots right here and simply say, remove the tool and it's gone. You'll also notice that uh, what my camera thing now just popped up. As you start to scroll through these things and collapse them and have them uh, open up and come uh, uh, open up and close and that kind of stuff, other stuff. So it's a dynamic palette, I guess is all I'm trying to say. But you can change things. So for instance, the, the camera just opened up, but I can click on the little triangle to collapse it again if I want to. So um, there's other things that we need to work out first. The next thing we're going to go after is capture naming, and this one's critical. In your all's capture naming, does what does it say right here? What does it say? Camera counter, yeah, it's a horrible thing. That's not what we want to have here at all. So this is what I'm gonna do to change this. This is always the default and it's meaningless. Nobody wants to actually use this. To change this, right next to the word that says format, click on the little, uh, it's a button. It's got a little three dots at the bottom, not up here at the top. If you click at this up at the top, this lets you, this is where you can reset your counter or remove the tool. That's not the three buttons I'm talking about, our three dots. It's the one that's right next to the format name. When you do that, it will actually open up a window, and this is where you can assign the name for your camera counter or what you want your files labeled as. So the first thing to do is simply hit the delete key to get rid of camera counter. Then hold down the shift key and put in an underscore. Again, in doing your camera naming, you don't want to keep spaces in here. You want it to be a solid string of characters, but the underscores actually give the illusion of space and make it far more legible to read. So I am going to do camera name. Then I'm going to scroll down. These things down here are called tokens. I'm going to scroll down here in the tokens. It's all done by alphabetical. And I want to come down here to destination folder name. 
and I'm going to grab that token and drag it up here into the top and let go. So now my naming convention so far is name underscore destination folder. And if you'll look at the sample right down here, you can see that that's exactly what is going on. I've got my, uh, the, my camera name or my session name, which is the 2019 uh, CCC uh, camera T. And then there's an underscore and an 01. That 01 is coming from the fact that I set 01 as my capture folder. Not done yet come back up here into the top and click right next to the name destination folder, put in another underscore, and then scroll to the very top of your tokens. And at the very top of your tokens, you will see there is a one digit counter token. Grab that token and drag that up to the top as well. And then finally click on there, there's a little uh, triangle drop down on uh, that one digital counter and bring it down to a three digit counter. And you'll see here now in your sample that this is perfectly named. This is exactly what I want it to be. All of my shootings are going to have the, the, the name of the session. They are going to be split up by 01, 02, 03. I don't have to go in and change this naming format any longer because it's already designed to do that. And then all of my frame count will be 001, 002 and all the way up. What this does limit you to, though, is this limits you to 999 captures before things start to go wrong. Again, when you hit that thousandth capture, we don't have a four digit naming convention. So if you know you're going to go over, if you're that kind of shooter, change this three digit counter to a four digit counter and you'll be OK. For me personally, I don't like the extra digits and I never shoot again. I may easily have a day where I'll do two or three hundred uh, or two or two thousand captures easily, but it's broken up by shot one, shot two, shot three, shot four. So I never, ever, ever go over that part. So um, again, this is something you guys just use the way you want to use it and you'll be fine. However, at this stage, we're not done. Click on this drop down menu that says presets and come down and say save user preset. And I'm going to call this versus naming. How do you spell naming? There's no E in there, is there? The older I get, the worse I get at spelling, which is hard to believe, but it's shit like that. Anyway, sorry. Um, they need spell check here. Uh, so at any rate, and then just hit save. And you'll see now that it is actually saved here as a preset. And these presets are universal. So if you build another session, this preset will be in here. Um, and if you copy that support folder in that I showed you guys about the application support folder for Capture One, um, all of these presets are saved in there. And you'll be good to go. So then finally, I'm going to hit OK on this guy. So that takes care of my naming convention. You'll also see that there is a sample right here. It's critical that you look at this sample and check out the frame count. Frame counts are sticky. So when we go from one shot to the next shot, you're going to have to reset this counter right here. This thing is, is dynamic, though. So um, uh, you'll see if, if, if you were to do 10 frames of one and then move to another shot, this will be ready to go at number 11. So this is not just showing you a sample. This is really indicating what is going to be happening next. The next thing down here in capture location, this is just a check. This was a feature that was requested ages ago in Capture One. It didn't used to exist there. It used to be that in order for you to go back and uh, uh, change your location, for, let's say we wanted to go from shot one to shot two, you had to go back to the library to do it. You can now simply do it from here. Um, and you'll see this uh, allows you to choose another folder. I don't think it's the most instinctive thing to do, but once we do our shots one, two, and three, it'll populate this folder and it's just a faster way to navigate back and forth. The next thing down is critical, space left. This is showing you the amount of space that is available on your hard drive. We've had this conversation before. You need 10% minimum of your hard drive on there. Uh, uh, so if you're not seeing a big number here, you need to worry about this because eventually as you're shooting, it will. if you don't have a lot of hard drive space on here, it will fill up your hard drive and then all of a sudden your computer will lock up 
up and you won't be able to quit this program. You won't be able to, you won't be able to do anything. You, it just, your computer locks up. So the reason they put this here is to make sure that you know that you have got actually good space on there. The next thing down is the capture, next capture adjustments. In this ICC profile, because I actually have a camera connected, it shows up here. If I disconnect my camera, which I just did, I just unplugged my USB cord, you'll see that this thing just lists as a default. However, if you plug this back in, hopefully it will recognize my camera again. It does. It recognizes this. I need you to click on this drop down menu. Now, if you, don't, if you do not see a whole bunch of things down here <clears throat> like this, if you go down to the very bottom, there will be a uh, show recommend. I don't know, there's a, the, again, it's showing all of mine. This may be also new in 12. In older version, do you guys have all this whole list? No, you don't? Show all. Yeah, hit show all, I was gonna say. So hit show all. So that part is still in there. You do not have a camera connected. Is it showing right there? So oh, it is showing right there. Yeah, is yours all just listing default? Okay, so then we can be really specific about it. So again, if you get this list, come down to Canon and go find, go find your camera. So in our case, these are 5D Mark III's. So if you'll come down here, this is an EOS 5D Mark III, and you'll see it just says generic on this. So you would simply click that and that will actually set it. But the reason I'm bringing you in here is, is that that's not always the case, especially if you come down here to the phase one camera groups. And in phase one camera groups, for instance, I shoot with a P30 plus. So I want you guys to come down here and pick P30 plus, and you will see that there is a whole series of different versions of camera ICC profiles. There's one for what they're calling an easy black flash. So this would be flash in the studio, uh, uh, easy black. Again, you'll get this little drop down telling you where it is. Easy black basically means it's opening up your shadows. Flash would be just a standard one, outdoor daylight. These things are pretty obvious. Uh, for what they are. If you go back up to the Canon group, you'll also notice that there are some flyout menus for certain Canon camera bodies. So the higher end EOS 1DS, you'll see you have four different possibles here. So you would want to make sure that you pick the right one for whatever it is. But again, in our case, there's only one and it is that five, uh, sorry, the 5D Mark III generic. And I'm going to go ahead and say okay to that. However, what's critical to notice about this is this is next capture adjustment. And what that means is if I've already got, if I've already shot a picture, it's got an ICC profile tagged on it. This simply means what's the next capture going to be tagged with. So this is not, if you have got your, uh, if you've already got captures done here and they end up having the wrong profile attached to them, this is not where you fix it. There's a different place. I'm going to show you that in just a second. This is pure and simply a place where you uh, go in to set up the next capture. Now, if you did this at the very beginning, like we're doing it right now, you won't have this mistake. You won't have something to fix, but that's where that's what this would actually be. The next thing down for orientation, if you click on this, orientation is actually really good. It senses your camera really well. So when you're shooting horizontally with your camera, it'll come in, your files will come in horizontally. If you change to a vertical, uh, orientation it'll come in vertical where it gets tricky is if you point your camera straight down to the ground if you point straight down to the ground it doesn't have the the gyros and the levels that are inside this camera body can't tell orientation anymore so you can override whatever is happening so for instance if I was shooting straight down and it gave me a horizontal image and I didn't want it to be horizontal, I wanted it to be vertical. Um, you could actually change this to 180, I'm sorry, to 90 degrees and it would orient it one way or the other. Now, the 90 degrees might be upside down, in which case you would go down to 270 degrees, but you can simply go through these and it, what it'll do, is it'll take whatever it felt like the orientation was and it'll spin it for you. You can spin stuff later. Um, this is what is these little guys that are right up here. Um, 
Actually, I take that back. Those are not those little guys. It's these guys right here. This is how you can actually rotate after the fact. But if you're shooting a whole lot of frames, it, it becomes a pain in the ass to have to rotate every single one of them. So at any rate, that's what's going on here. I'm going to simply leave that at its default. In the metadata, as this actually comes down here, we are going to actually uh, uh, leave this in its defaults. The default is to actually copy this guy from the last. You can override this to do certain other things. We will look at this in greater depth when we get to the metadata template, which will happen later on. But for right now, you can simply leave that as metadata. For the other, copy from last, again, we're just going to leave that at its defaults. And then finally, styles. We're not going to use any styles here right now. We'll talk about styles later on as well. Um, the one thing that I would say here that you could use in all of this in terms of the built-in styles, let me see if I've got any here. Yeah, it would actually simply be if you wanted your images to appear to be black and white because an art director wanted to see them in black and white, Conceivably, this would be a place to do it, and you could actually pick a black and white neutral style here, um, and then the captures that you would do would be black and white. But in our case, I'm simply going to leave this as none. You do not want to check auto alignment on this. Uh, again, that part is actually taken care of up in here. Um, I'm going to skip over camera really quickly and go down to camera focus. You'll see in camera focus, if you use its drop down menu, this thing is actually allows you to control a camera. However, the only cameras that are supported are the latest, greatest phase one cameras. We do not, it, do, it will not support a Nikon or a Canon or a Sony, so we can get rid of this. This is wasted space for us. So again, I'm going to click on those little three dots and I'm going to remove that tool. The things that I do care about in this, if I click and look at my camera to open this guy up, I have got a white balance set tool that's in here. I've got all the controls of my camera in here. So that part is actually good for me. I'm Instead of collapsing camera now, I'm going to collapse the adjustments. Uh, they're set. I don't need to see them anymore. Uh, I'm also going to collapse my naming. It's set. I don't need it anymore. I may go back to that in just a second. However, there are controls that I do want to have on my camera, so or that I do want to have in this screen. So the first one that I want to actually add to this screen is, um, again, if you cover over in this area, and we're going to do a right click. So hold down your control key, click and get a drop down menu. And, and, when, and when it comes down to add tool, what I actually am going to add to this is um, high dynamic range. And I'm going to click on that. And that brings in a dynamic range slider. And the reason I want to have this here is as I'm going through and checking for exposure, um, at times, we, you'll be right on the line. You'll, you'll actually see that you've got a little bit of clipping that maybe instead of being in that 245 to 250 range in your white patch, it's a little bit hotter than that. Or your white patch says you're definitely in that range, but you've got something in your subject matter that actually looks like it's blowing out and it's flagging, it's being flagged that it's actually blowing out. This high dynamic range is just highlight recovery or shadow recovery. And really quickly, you can drop down here and simply grab this guy and crank it up to see if indeed you are clipping something. So it's just a thing that I like to have handy for me right here. And then the last thing that I actually like is a large focusing check for me. So again, I'm going to, in this area down here in the bottom, hold down the control key, click to get a drop down menu. The tool that I'm actually going to add here is focus. And this now has opened up a big screen here. When you go to actually do a picture right now, this allows you to set points on your picture to actually check focus. This is also a place that will develop out whatever small area of your image that you, you're hovering over. It will develop it completely out. So this is another good place to check for things like moray. But focus is our biggest guy. So the last thing we need to do before we actually start to take any pictures with this is to set a couple of our um, preferences. So to do that, come up to the Capture One menu, come down to Preferences, and in this Preference folder that comes up, we're going to blow through, um, we're not going to deal with all of these, but we're going to blow through a set of them really quick. If you click on General right now, you can leave General exactly the way it is. If you click on Appearance, this all Appearance does is control how light or dark this uh, interface is. So leaving it at very dark, that's the interface, that's the default, that's fine. You can leave it here. Image, as you go to Image Over, this actually, again, you can leave at its defaults right now. The next one, Capture Over, and this is a huge place for you to know about. This, I don't know, there's somebody in the studio that keeps going in here and turning off 
all of these things, which means your camera is not recognized. So if we uncheck Canon right here, you will not see, if you say okay to this, it says you need to restart to do that. If I restarted my camera, my Capture One right now, no matter what I did, it would never see this Canon camera. I'm not gonna do that, I'm gonna turn it back on. But I do, there's somebody in the studio who's maliciously turning this shit off. The reason this exists, and it's, they've gotten with every iteration of Capture One, it's gotten better, um, but it used to be every single one of these camera manufacturers has a unique USB interface and every now and then they can conflict with one another. So if you're having trouble connecting, this is one of the places, one of the things that you can try. If no matter what you do, you cannot get your Canon camera to connect, come in here and turn off Phase, Nikon, Fuji, and Sony, and only leave the Canon one on. That means that Capture One will only load its USB interface for Canon, and it's again, it's a way to alleviate a problem, but also, this is one of the places that I go here and I just check this guy out right off the get-go to make sure that my camera has been turned on and support. So in our case, mine was on, I'm good to go. Did anybody have one that were something other than where Canon or Nikon was turned off? No, nope. okay. Uh, next one over, color. I'm going to actually leave this exactly the way it is. Next one over, exposure. This is a biggie. By default, this is not set up correctly. So in mine, I actually set my exposure, the exposure warning at the top, this is going to be our highlight warning up here at the, at the beginning. I actually uh, bring this, it's a slider up here at the top. I drag the slider back to 250 because again, this lets me say that anything, again, if, if I know that a white patch or a white uh, a shirt or a white uh, um, uh, a piece of seamless or whatever, is in that 245 to 250 range. I know it has detail. If it's getting flagged and telling me that it's above that range, then I know it's something that I need to look at and worry about. By default, enable shadow warning is not turned on. I do enable this and I set it at 15. Again, this is about detail. I, this is not black point and white point. This is about shadow detail and highlight detail. And this is typically where I set mine. Um, the next things over, we don't need to worry about. Crop we'll look at later. Uh, this is the focus tool. The focus tool actually works pretty well. However, this whole idea of threshold and opacity are uh, somewhat um, uh, esoteric terms. Um, basically, what they're really doing is they're looking at contrast. Um, that's how autofocus works is um, uh, uh, it, your camera starts to search uh, it refocuses looking to get the most contrasty image that you can get because you can imagine if you actually have an image that is completely out of focus, there are no hard edges, um, uh, uh, it's, it, it mushes your whole image together, um, not very contrasty. As you start to get it in focus, it starts to take on contrast, it starts to build edges, that kind of stuff. So anyway, that's how autofocus works and that's what this tool is looking for. Um, I typically leave this at its defaults. The rest of the stuff you don't need to worry about if you go to warnings I leave them all on the next one is where you can actually update your camera and then the last one is if we use plugins in here and nobody's using plugins right now you can use certain plugins here like the Nick um, tool set that if you have been in my retouching class or some of my other classes that's supported in here this is where you would actually deal with that part so then I can close this guy up and we should be actually ready to go so I am going to set my camera to take a picture in here and I'm going to set it to take a picture of those guys over there somewhere. I have no idea what it's going to take a picture of, but that's going to be my guess. Um, what do you think the exposure in this room is right now? Come on, it's just a game we play and you know I play it all the time, all right? So guess. Okay, don't have time to guess. I'm going to go to uh, 400 ISO. I'm going to go to a 15th of a second. You can do this with me. I don't, you got to point your camera at something. We're going to take pictures. So make sure your camera's on. And I'm going to actually go wide open here. And I'm going to click on this and see what happens. 
and it's relatively close, although I have no idea what the hell this thing is focusing on, which will be interesting here. So we can tell what it thinks it's focusing on. So to do that, up here at the top, you can see that, again, I have an exposure warning. So I'm going to click on that exposure warning to begin with, and you can see that what is being flagged right now. It's telling me that this area over here is actually gone out to pure white, and I don't have any idea what It's the what? No, no, no. See this area right here? This is actually a pure white on my image, and I have no idea what it is. It's... It's the light back there. Oh, it is. It is. So it's the light that's in the... It's, it's the direct light that's in the workbench. That's actually blown out. Um, again, if I turn on this warning as well, this is also telling me that that little area of the speaker and this area down here is actually below threshold. So. I'm not really all that concerned about that part right now. Uh, again, it would be a, a reasonably good, uh, it was a pretty good guess actually about what's going on. Um, but I could actually change a number of things in here. I could actually open this up a little bit more. So I'm gonna take it up another stop by putting this on an 800 and say okay to that. And that opens up the whole background areas a little bit more. Again, I'm going to click on my exposure warning right here to see what's actually blowing out. And this is probably would work better for me. It's got a little bit more shadow detail. The area that's blowing out in the back that is white probably should be white. So I'm not too concerned about that. So again, that's just the game that I would play in here. However, if you turn this off and come over to your focus mask and click that on, you will see that there is nothing in my image that is actually in focus. So I'm going to take my camera a little bit to the side and see this is not autofocusing. All right, my autofocus part is on. Oh, <laughs> you know the buttons I reset on this? I took the autofocus off of my shutter release. Never mind. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to try one. And my focus mask is still telling me it doesn't think anything in this image is sharp. So I may have camera shake here and let's find out. Yeah, it still doesn't think I have anything in here in focus. When we get to, I take that back, it does. Can you see those little green dots on that cord right there? I'm going to zoom into it. That's what this, uh, that's what Capture One feels like I have in focus. It's these little green dots. That's what this focus mask is all about right here. So you'll see if I turn it off, those little green dots go away, but it feels like that's the only thing in my image that's actually sharp. Um, but at any rate, so that part is, that's sort of what's going on here. You will also notice here on your screen over on the thumbnails that it's actually things are doing exactly what we hoped it would do. It's giving me the file name, the entire one, into shot one, zero, zero, five, and we're all good to go. So is this working for everyone? Okay. I want to go back to my library now. I'm going to click on the library, and then I'm going to start doing my shot number two. I've already shot number one. It looks great. Art director loves it. Everything is fabulous. So I'm going to click on number two to actually make it active. Again, do your right click, control click, and say you want to set this now as your capture folder. And you will see that the little icon for your camera has dropped right down here for your capture folder. Again, if you were to hold down the, uh, come up here to your capture folder, you'll see that there are no thumbnails here anymore. If you were to come up to your capture folder, do your right click here and say, show that to me in the finder. And this is a good habit to get into. It's just confirmation that yes, indeed, this second folder has been selected. So I'm confident about that part. Go back to your camera counter, uh, to your camera guy, and you now need to open up this next capture naming part right here. And you'll see what I mean that is a problem. It, it's not a problem, but it's a problem with this guy uh, right here. You will see 
that my sample here is not picking up the sample. Let me kick this a little wider. Yeah, it's just because it was being truncated. You will see that it actually has picked the destination folder, which is O2. So <clears throat> it's taking care of that part of my naming convention automatically for me. But you'll also notice that this frame counter is now saying it's going to start at 006. And this is just, again, it's just something you have to know about and you're constantly looking at this. So it's starting here at 006 because I shot five frames in my uh, shot number one folder. So whatever number of frames that you guys shot, this is ready to do the next one. However, this is incorrect. I need this to be frame number one of my shot two because again, it's going to be a separate shot. So to get that to reset, come up to the little three um, uh, uh, dots that are up at the top, not the three that are next to the name, but the three that are up next to the question mark, click on that drop down menu and come down to reset capture counter. And this will drop back to one and now we are actually ready to go to do a different set of pictures. So now I'm gonna shoot in another direction. Focus first and then go to my camera and click on that. And this now I've got these guys that are going on in the background to see what your focus thing actually looks like. You've got to, I've got to get down here, but my controls for my focus are down here at the bottom and I can't see them. So again, I'm gonna collapse my camera and down at the bottom of my focus, I can click on that little um, uh, um, uh, magnifying glass and I can come over here and click on this guy and you can actually see that part is uh, actually not in focus, but I wasn't actually focusing on that part. It's probably something closer to here, but this lets you move around and actually uh, pinpoint your focus uh, to check on it. When I was talking earlier about your high dynamic range, I'm going to zip back out um, this is where my screen is right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to click on my exposure warning and see if I have anything that's blown out. It is actually blowing out a highlight that's on that cart and it's also blowing out a highlight on the text right here. Now again, you just want to make sure, for me, I think that this exposure is probably relatively good. I'm looking at the white, uh, uh, car, uh, the white board that's down there. That can actually function as a white patch for me. And you'll see it was giving me a reading of 235, which is telling me that I am slightly underexposed on this. I need to worry a little bit about those two highlight parts right here, but we'll see. But I'm going to go ahead and bump this area right in here up. It's reading a 244. So truth be told, this probably is the right exposure. But if I was worried about holding detail in this part right here, instead of actually reprocess, instead of changing my exposure right now, I would simply come over to highlight slider and I would grab this and kick it up. And the entire time I'm doing it, I'm watching what's happening to that little red. And you can see that red is beginning to disappear. And as I continue to get it all the way up, it is completely gone. So that tells me that even though I am pushing the line on this, that I can recover my highlights in software. And this would indicate to me that this is the correct exposure. I zero this stuff back out once I do that. This is not something that you want to use right now. This is something that we use actually when we do process inside of Capture One. But for me, this would just be a check on that stuff. Does that sort of make sense, everyone? Are we good on that part? Uh, are there questions about anything else that's going on up in here? Uh, you can see that I've got my, again, my focus mask is still on and it's indicating that this area up in here is actually in focus. You can see it's that overlay. It's all, I, if you want to zoom in really quickly, simply hold down your space bar and double click on the hand and it'll zoom in. It's telling me that it feels like that those areas of text that are right in there are actually sharp and in focus. Um, that's what's going on here. Sometimes this thing works really well. Sometimes I think it's a little bit iffy. Are there questions about any of this? Are we good on this part? So it depends, you'd have to be using a phase camera, which okay. you're not. So you're using a Canon camera, so go to the Canon guy. Yeah, exactly, know. yeah, that's exactly what you would be using. It's just to know that those things are there. Okay. Uh, are there questions about any of this, guys? Are we good? All right, let me check here one more second just to make sure that I've gotten through all of this part. I've gotten through that. Oh. Yeah, 
Let's go back to the camera drop down uh, part right here. This camera drop down right here. There is live view exists here inside of Capture One and it's this little thing right here. Uh, if you click on this, it will actually open up and, and this is actually now a live view. You can see as I move my camera around, it will move. Now, ironically, live view uh, exists in a lot of cameras and live view is how, uh, is my view, these cameras were, <clears throat> were initially never designed to shoot video, but they came out with live view. And when people said, well, okay, you've got live view, why, why on earth don't you just capture the live view? Um, and everybody said, oh yeah, that makes sense, whatever. And then they realized they could sell a billion more cameras because they could sell them as video cameras instead of just still cameras. But it all came out of this. Unfortunately, in Capture One, there is no recording of live view. So there is no video support in Capture One. There is no face support for video. There is fa no face camera records video. These Canon cameras and Nikons and Sonys will all record video, but that video recording is not supported here in Capture One. So what people usually do for this is that people will use live view here to actually do composition, to set things up and to do uh, um, uh, that, basically how uh, um, they, uh, um, they'll, they'll have a live preview so they can sort of see how things are laying out on screen. They don't have to constantly go back to a camera and, and look through the viewfinder to actually do their composition. So while we're on that subject, to get out of Live View, Live View is actually its own separate window. It's actually opened up a window. You'll see I don't have thumbnails anymore. I don't have library over here anymore. Simply close this window that's opened up and we are now out of Live View. But the last thing that I do want to show you here really quickly, because it's something that you may run into, and it's this thing right up here. It's, it looks like a circle with a X series of X's through it. Um, if you click on that, you'll actually see that it puts those, um, those guys on your screen. It puts a bunch of them on your screen. You can see right now, in my case, I have got a single frame that is in this shot number uh, two. Well, here, let's do this, let's do this. Uncheck that right there, turn that guy off. Let's do one last one here. So again, go to the library. We're gonna come down and we're gonna make shot number three, our folder number three, our subfolder number three, our capture folder. So hover over this, hold down the control key, whatever your right click is, and say you wanna set this as your capture folder. Go back to the camera uh, drop down menu. And remember, we've already got a single frame that went into number two. So we've got to reset our capture counter right here. This should just be, it's standard one, two, three. You change the, the, your, your destination folder. You come immediately over here and you reset your capture counter. So I'm gonna reset my capture counter here. And then let's say I wanna do lighting checks. Now, in most cases, when you guys do lighting checks, um, you like to save all the frames that you shoot, right? But there's a lot of people who don't work that way. There's a lot of people who would say, okay, I'm gonna do this instead. You can go ahead and click on that composition thing and you'll see that you don't see anything on your screen right now, but then do a capture. Go ahead and click on this to do a capture. Okay, everybody should take a look at my camera. I need everybody to come over here and look at this camera really quickly. Because this is a, it's a great thing to actually see this happen and you actually need to know about this part. So I tried to fire my camera from the software, which is indeed possible. That's what that little button is about. But you can see that I didn't get any capture. And now when I click on this thing to autofocus, do you see this busy warning that I'm getting right here? So what is happening is, is that when you actually take a picture, there is inside of this camera, there is, um, there's actually memory. It's not a memory card that's going in here. It's actually inside the camera. And it's designed to temporarily hold your images so that you can shoot really fast. So what happens is, is that as I start to shoot in here, that, they call it a buffer, that buffer actually starts to fill up. And, but the whole time it's taking in information, it's taking in the next capture, it's also trying to write shit out to my computer as fast as it can. So if you take, I need everybody to look in their camera really quickly. Now I can't see mine, but I can tell you what it is. Just tap your frame really slightly. If you look inside of your camera, you'll see that you have uh, an aperture setting that, I mean, sorry, a shutter speed setting that's all the way on the left-hand side. Is that where it is? 
What's all the way on the left hand? Then that's followed by an aperture setting. Then you've got the scale that is your meter, right? And then next to that on the far right hand side, there should be a number that sits in a parentheses. Do you have that? Start firing your camera really fast and watch that number. That number will start to creep down. That is your buffer number. That is the number of frames that your camera can actually hold. And you'll see, usually I think yours starts at 13. That means it's capable of handling 13. As you start to shoot, that number goes down. But it, when you quit shooting, it'll start to go back up again because it's, uh, anything that's being held in the buffer is being written to your computer. So there are photographers that'll be working who bottom out and they bottom out because they shoot really fast. They, they'll bottom out really quickly um, because they hit that buffer and you need to tell them you, they either need to slow down or they've got to take a pause to let that buffer clear out and write to your camera. What's happened with my camera though is this is a buffer. The buffer here is locked up. That's what that busy warning was about. To get rid of that, the only way you can get rid of this, you can, if you turn your camera off, it does not empty the buffer. The only way to get rid of this is to pop the battery out of your camera. When you pop the battery out, you take it out and you count to 20. Don't throw this thing right back in again. You've got to, this is now clearing the buffer. The problem with that is, is that if, let's say, the, the, the one of the frames that was in the buffer is the money shot. It was the minute John Kennedy's head exploded in the car. You've lost that picture. Whatever was in the buffer, we have now just lost. So, but there's no way to get it out. Once this camera locks up, there is no way to get that part out. So I'm gonna go back to this again. And you'll see I've now got a frame up here and it does have those little crosses on here and you'll also see it's got a frame here, number one. I'm gonna change the exposure on my camera um, I'm going to actually add a whole nother stop. So I'm simply going to go to an eighth of a second and fire off another frame. And what you'll see is my picture now is considerably brighter, but you'll also see I didn't add another frame to that. What this is called is composition mode. And what's happening in composition mode is, is that you never end up with more than a single frame. It continues to overwrite. So this just overwrote that my original frame number one, the one that really did have probably the proper exposure. Um, I'm going to do another change in here again. I'm going to actually add another stop to this and do it again. And you'll still see it gets brighter and brighter and brighter. And my warning here is telling me that this is all blown out now. Again, I can uncheck that part here, and you can see that this is blown out right here. Look up there, I'm at a 253. And that's something to know about the exposure warnings. If any of your channels is clipped, um, then you'll get that warning. Now, this is actually not the worst thing in the world, because you can see I've got green and blue detail in here, uh, but the 253 in the red channel is what's giving me that exposure warning when I actually turn it on. But this um, uh, composition mode, so there, what I'm saying is, is that there are people who will keep it in composition mode because they don't want to take up space on their hard drive with doing their lighting, their pre-lighting check. But there's a liability in this, and the liability in this is that if you never turn this thing off and all of a sudden you're ready to go and you, do, you get your subject out there and you're starting to shoot whatever and you stay in composition mode, at the end of it all, you will only un end up with one single frame. So what most people will do is, they, people who work in composition mode like this, it's a completely viable thing to do, but the minute you get whatever is going to be your final subject in place, you turn this thing off. So um, now that it is turned off, again, if I hit another exposure on this, you'll see I'll now start to actually hit frame number two and I start to actually move on. Does that make sense, everyone? Finally, the last thing, we need to go back to our shot number one. So come back into your here to shot number one. Again, click on it and we are going to make it active. Uh, we're gonna make it the designated, set it as the capture folder. So click on this 01, hold down your control key to get your drop down mouse, say set this as capture folder 01. Then you need to look at the number of captures that are already in here. And you can see I've got five frames that are already in here. However, when I go to my camera, in my camera part, it's actually going to start naming it at 03 because it, 
is taking this from my shot 03 where I had two frames already, it thinks I'm going simply to my third frame. So in this case, you do not want to reset this to zero because you've already got a zero, a zero one right here. You actually want to have this start at frame number six. So again, go to that same drop down menu that you use to reset your counter and instead of reset, you want to set and then you type in a number six, because that's gonna be the next frame, and say okay. Now you'll see that this is going to start at frame 006, which is exactly where we wanna be, because we've already got five of them in here, and so now when I fire my camera here, yes, indeedy, this did work out right, and it's actually naming, and everything is staying in order now. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes, shoot. Yes. Yeah. And so you don't want to turn it off. What you can do is if you don't get that buffer freeze, what will happen is, is that the buffer will zero out. So it'll go from that 13 all the way down to zero and you will not be able to shoot anymore. Your camera won't let you shoot. But if you just wait, if you just wait, you will see that number start to rise back up again. Some people, though, the minute it gets to number one, they start shooting again right away and you get like two or three frames and it fills the buffer again and then you let it go back to 13 and then you can start but 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 no that's a great question is, is that go ahead and let them if it if it if you don't get the busy thing and you see that number start to creep back up again it's it's writing those uh, uh those those things to your card uh i mean to your computer no it's not but again that's another reason that you want to actually be tethered to the internal hard drive of this and not to an external hard drive because the internal hard drive of your computer is radically faster than if you're writing to an external hard drive so you always shoot to the internal hard drive and then copy it onto an external are there questions about any of this are we good um, okay guys um i've got um uh, 1001 uh, if we can uh, shut this down uh, and be back a quarter after, that'd be great. And uh, we'll get into lighting. Are we still going to do I don't think... Oh, wait, 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 just one minute. No, we are good. This is, you know, uh, no, you don't need, you can break all this down.